Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, let's give him glory this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather be here than in the best hospital in Bloomington, Indiana. Because this is the best hospital, isn't it? Amen, amen. It's good to be in the house of God. It just feels good to feel the glory of God. And, you know, uh, something that the Lord has always, He always quickens in me is that my life matters to Him. Your life matters to Him. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you matter. You matter to God. You matter to God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I say that this morning because there's an enemy, an enemy of our soul out there that uh, he says that you don't matter. How many has heard that? You don't matter. Come on now. Am I the only one that's ever heard that in my life? You know? Well, he's a liar, isn't he? He's a liar. Praise God. God's given us all authority. He's given us all power over all the power of the enemy. We stand victorious this morning. And I know... You know, what we do here this morning, coming to the house of God, you know, the enemy would say that this doesn't matter. You can be a Christian without going to church. You can be a Christian without gathering together with God's people. You know, he tells everybody that. But see, you gain, you're victorious this morning because you told him to go fly a kite. You know? And that's a battle. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God's so good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, Lord, for your plan of salvation for our lives. We thank you, Father God, Lord, for healing, healing us. Lord, taking the broken pieces, Lord God, of our lives. Lord, that that mess, Lord God, that that's all we had to offer because we had destroyed, Lord, what you were trying to restore and to make brand new lord god but finally lord god we ran up the white flag lord god we surrendered our lives to you lord god and lord god you you put back the broken pieces lord god and and lord god you've you've turned something so miserable into something so beautiful lord god and you did that lord god you did that lord with your with your wonderful mercies and lord god your loving kindness father god and we thank you lord for your amazing grace lord god We thank you so much, Lord God, for all that you continue to do, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for winning the battle for us, Lord. Lord God, we know that there's still a fight to fight, but we read the back of the book and we win, Lord God. And we're grateful for that, Lord. We're thankful, Lord God. We give you all praise for that, Lord. In the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
We are strong in the Lord. Amen, amen. Yeah. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. amen. Without him, we can do nothing. Amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Fighting against a defeated foe. Remember that. Amen. He thinks he can win it. 
But we know he can. Amen. Because he's already been defeated. Praise God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Some people think that God and the devil are just up here and they're just quo equals and they're, they're duking it out and battling it out. But I want to tell you what. <laughs> if you want to get a good look at the devil, just lift up your foot. And you can see a piece of dirt down there on the floor, a piece of lint. That's how he is in comparison to God. Now, we can't stand against him. He's not, he's not afraid of us, but he is absolutely terrified of the Jesus that's in us. Terrified of the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Our God is, a, is an all-consuming fire. Our God is... A, a, praise God. He's unconquerable. Praise God. Never lost a tug of war yet. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To the depths of the sea Nations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall To the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings I'm 
Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know it takes such an amazing God to have such amazing grace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb of God. Just love Him this morning. Just thank Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Come and show your power.
up, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Purify your people, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Let your fire fall, O oh God. Lord God, draw us closer to you, Lord God. Help us to help us to feel, Lord God, the lateness, the nearness of the hour, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, when you will come back, Lord, when you will split the eastern sky. Lord God, and every eye shall behold you, Lord God. And Lord, in your church, Lord God, will be caught up to meet you, Lord, in the air, Lord God. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Help us, Lord God. Help us to resign ourselves, to yield ourselves to your plan, Lord God. Lord God, praise the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the word of God this morning, Lord God. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Power, power from on high. Power to overcome. Power to overcome this flesh, Lord. Power to overcome the world, Lord. Power to overcome the evil one, Lord God. We thank you, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God. Let your fire fall, God. Let your fire fall. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Mm. God's good. God is good. Amen. 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 Praise the Lamb of God. You may be seated this morning if you can. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's so good to see everyone. Praise the Lamb of God. Amen. Good to wake up the wake up this morning with Jesus on our mind. Amen. You know, this is the Lord's day when we honor and thank God. We thank Him for just being so immeasurably good to us. Amen. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Better than we deserve. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Does everyone have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Hmm? Well, that's something to shout about right there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen, amen. And the Bible says, hold fast. Hold fast to that which you have. Hold on. There's an enemy out there. There's a devil out there wanting to steal what you got. Wants to take it away from you. He ain't getting it, is he? He ain't getting it. That's right. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. We just want to... Welcome everyone out, and and uh, uh, you know this. People's complaining about this heat. You know, I mean, I'd rather have it to be ninety than ten foot of snow. <laughs> and I've just found out you just can't you just can't please everybody. <laughs> Amen. 
God's good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. How many found out if you just if you just focus on pleasing God? Amen. That's all we need to do, isn't it? It'll it'll give you a much better, healthier, stress free life. Amen. 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 Well, we just want to welcome everyone. How many first time visitors do we have with us this morning? Any first timers this morning? Got two right up here. Got one right over there. We got another one back there. First timers. Got any over here? Yeah, we got a. Randy, you're not a first timer. Oh, oh, I see. (laughs) One right behind you there. All right. Well, it's good to see everyone. Glad to have everyone out today. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We have a gift of appreciation for all of our first timers this morning. If you're a first timer, lift your hand up. Make sure your, your hand stays up. We don't want to miss anyone. I just want to remind you that Jesus loves you. God has a plan for your life. Amen. Amen. Hasn't changed his mind about you. Amen. It's so good. Praise God. I don't know if I told this story last week or not, but I'm still praying for this gal that uh, was on my way down to the boogie last week, and and uh, we're setting up camp, and and a gal uh, caught up with me in her car. is on 37. She said, "You yelled at me. You going to the boogie?" Yeah. I gave her a thumbs up. She said, "Can I follow you?" And I said, "Sure." So she got in behind us there, and and a little bit later she come up again. You're going to stop at a gas station. So I thought, well, she needs some gas. So we, I said, yeah, we'll, we'll pull in at Harrodsburg. And so here she was by herself in his car, pulls in, and uh, she had to go to the bathroom. She didn't need gas. But anyway, <laughs> so, so she walked up on the, Rick and I, and, and then I, evidently, uh, I don't know if she just saw her patches or the, the patch on her back or the cross on my on my fairing, or she just saw our, our just our radiant Christian smile. <laughs> yeah, that could have been it. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, she pulls the sunglasses off her face, and she said, uh, you guys are Christian, Christian bikers, aren't you? And I said, yes, we are. And I said, we're going down to the boogie to see if we can uh, spread some gospel and, and uh, <clears throat> talk to some people, and she just got all gommy, you know, in her eyes, and and, uh, well, that was such a meeting because she said, uh, well, I was a Christian. I was a Christian, she said. She said, I was, I, I was going to church for two or three years and, and got all caught up and, you know, blah. And she said, the devil got me back. I said, well, I said, do you know that uh, God's never changed his mind about you? You know, he's got a plan for your life. And she got all gummy again in her eyes. And <laughs> You know, if, if I went down there just for that. Amen. That's right. That's how much God loves her. That's, right. that's how much he cares about her. And I hope, I hope I ruined her weekend there. I just hope I ruined her weekend. Amen. And then, you ran into her, didn't you? No, uh uh-uh, didn't know. And then, and then she ate breakfast with several of the guys. She was at a vendor there, and they're talking. All of a sudden, I guess they started making conversation with her. And she said, well, I already met your pastor. And so God was not going to leave her alone. Amen. That's what God does, doesn't he? He doesn't leave you alone. <clears throat> because your life matters. Amen. You know? And we believe that's where Jesus would have been, and he was there. He Amen. was there. Amen. We have went. We have went there in the past and ran into people that we have known, and 
and had fell away from God, you know, and, and, and got so upset, we watched them pack all their stuff up and leave because <laughs> it ruined their weekend. Amen. Especially since we was camped right next to them. <laughs> so God's good, isn't he? God is good. Amen. Amen. I know we're a little bit, we're a little bit late on, on this and, uh, uh, graduations have already taken place, but we customarily always want to, uh, recognize our high school graduates and, and any college graduates and you've graduated from, uh, uh, a technical school of any sort. So, do we have do we have any uh, here this morning that you graduated from high school? Nobody graduated from high school. Last oh, new new graduates. That's what that's what I meant to say. 2016. I know we have some, but they must not be here this morning. I know uh, Rachel Allison graduated, didn't she? And, she, and who else? Uh, who else? Does anybody know anybody else? So I, I want to catch up with her. Amen. Who? What'd she say? Becca. Oh, Becca, right. Becca graduated. Becca Stid. And she, she grew up here, little Becca. She's so cute. 18 years old now. Amen. Oh, is it... Uh, when she first had to go downstairs, she said she didn't think it was fair. Said we have to come downstairs, and you get to you guys get to step stairs with God. <laughs> Kids are so cute. They got communion for the first time, and she was just just loved uh, just loved uh, kids' church. And she said, "But the snacks are kind of crummy. <laughs> snacks are snacks are pretty stingy. Got this little bitty drink and a little piece of bread." Oh my, God is so good. Do we have any uh, any college graduates here? Anybody graduate from a technical college or vocational school? Or all right, just want to make sure. Don't want to leave anybody out. Amen. Can you say God is good? God is good. Amen. Well, we are blessed here this morning to be uh, honored with uh, uh, a couple here that's. Uh, uh, been involved with the uh, Gideons. Amen. Did you say thirty? Is that thirty some years? How long have you been with the Gideons? I'll let you tell it. All right, Johnny. All right, David and Cindy Longs are going to come up here now, Amen. and they're going to they're going to share with us about the Gideons. You going to come up, Cindy? You, you here's a here's another microphone if you want if you got something to say. Okay, well, here it is. I'm just going to leave it on. All right, brother. God bless you. Okay. Juan Tres de SEC. Por qué del tal manero amó Dios al mundo? Que ha dado a su hijo unigenito, para que todo aquel que en él cree no se pierda más tenga vida eterna. John 3:16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the verse I quoted in Venezuela on April the 9th. 2016, I barely got the first word out of my mouth and they took over. I couldn't even hear whether I said it right or not. Those folks are so hungry for Jesus that we gave out 189,000 Spanish New Testaments in five days. One at a time. We were supposed to give out 250000 but they were so hungry for Jesus, we had to stop and lead them to the Lord. As soon as you ask them, yes! And we had to say, slow down a minute, we got some scripture verses to read. But when we told them that in the middle of the book, that changed my life forever, and put love in me for you, and actually for the people of the world, I said, God changed my life, and he can do the same thing for you. 
And when we told the little children in fifth grade that, they all raised their hand, they all wanted a book, and they all wanted God in their hearts to change their lives. When we handed them the book, they opened it, stuck their nose in it. Oh, that smells so good. They had not seen a new book of any kind for 10 years. Most of them, this was their first Bible ever. And they were so happy to get it. I told my Venezuelan uh, interpreter, I said, they're smelling the fragrance of God. And do you know God has a fragrance? And it is good. We carry with us the greatest news that man has ever heard or known. By the way, those... 189,000 Bibles were bought from people just like you who put money in an offering and goes, I want to help send God's word around the world. And those children in Venezuela have a Bible that they couldn't afford, probably would never have, because somebody just like you gave a dollar and 30 cents so that we could carry this book to them and tell them that God has a plan for your life and it's good. He has a destiny. And they bought that hook, line, and sinker. And you know why? Why not? That's the best message in the world. And it's no secret, as far as I'm concerned, the Savior's name is Jesus. And this book tells all about that Jesus. We carry the greatest news in the world, and the news is Jesus saves. Can you say that with me? Jesus saves. One more time. That sounds good. Jesus saves. Pastor, you have a Jesus-loving group of people here. Wow. And that's what the Gideons are all about, so I'm in the right house. And I am blessed to be here this morning, along with my wife, Cindy. Cindy has stuck with me for 41 years. She's a kindergarten teacher, loves the Lord with all of her heart. And we have a part of the Gideon ministry is the auxiliary. And I'd like for you to hear from Cindy as she tells you a little bit about what the auxiliary does. Is this on? Here you go, sweetie. Good morning. The number one purpose of the Gideon is to stand with our husbands in prayer. So while they're out on the streets and uh, being witnesses for Christ, we're in the behind the scenes praying. But we do go into the medical facilities and take the Bibles. If you sat in, sat in a waiting room at a doctor's office, we take them to dental offices, veterinarian clinics, hospital waiting rooms. Many times you're sitting in a hospital in a time of crisis and you have the Word of God there to read. Uh, just this week, uh, we had the Gideon's International Conference. And after our uh, meetings in the morning, We got on buses and went to the streets of Indianapolis, and we were able to witness to people on the streets. We saw many people that were setting with cardboard boxes. Uh, You see the the need for Christ. Uh, There are so many hurting people in this world, and we were able to share scriptures, to pray with people, and it was quite a blessing this week in what God is doing. In 1908, the Gideons placed their first Bible in hotels and motels. Maybe some of you have seen those in the drawers. We placed 5,000 Bibles in 1908. From 1908 to 2001, we placed our one billionth Bible in the hand of President George Bush, which he carried with him when he shared to the nations that the Twin Towers had fallen. And he said that that Bible gave him strength. That was $5 Bible. Somebody in a place just like this put a $5 bill in that offering so that George Bush could carry that Bible with him and stand before the nation shaking in his shoes knowing that we need God's help. I love to tell stories, but I do have statistics to tell you. We placed this year 91 million Bibles in the hands of men, women, boys, and girls in the traffic lanes of life. That's three scriptures every second 365 days of the year, the Word of God is going forth. In the last 14 years, folks, that took us 93 years to pass out our billionth Bible. In the last 14 years, 
we are blessed and give glory to God that we have passed out already our second billionth Bible. God is speeding things up, people. Jesus is coming back. The word is getting out. And men, women, boys and girls are turning to Jesus. We are so blessed to be a part of a ministry that connects with churches like yours to help win the world to Jesus Christ. There's a scripture in Isaiah 55, 11 that says, this is a promise according to the word of God. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Pastor, it shall not return void. Do not become discouraged. Don't give up. Don't run away. God is fulfilling his word and he will bring it to pass. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. I want to tell you a story. I love to tell stories. I have more statistics, but let me tell you this story about Nicky Farmer. Nicky Farmer was from Scotland. He came to the United States for the first time in his life. He landed in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was taken by a taxi, him and three other boys, all from Europe, to sell books to raise money for college. The taxi driver dropped him off at Richard's Restaurant in Kokomo, Indiana, where I was having a Gideon prayer breakfast. The man in my Gideon group, our chaplain, he had a stack of personal worker Bibles just like this. He said, you men, God has called you to share the gospel. You need to get you a stack of these and start handing them out. So I bought 10. Took him in my arms As I was walking out of the restaurant, I saw four boys standing in the middle of the parking lot. Walk right up to them. I go, you boys look lost. And they go, we are. We have no idea where our orientation place is. I said, well, hop in my car. I'll take you. I'll show you all over Kokomo, and I'll take you to where you're being orientated. And so when we got there, I said, I have a gift for all of you boys. And, And they were about 18, maybe. And I gave each one of them a New Testament I said, may I pray with you? And they said, sure, fine. They wasn't sure what I was going to do, and I'm not sure they really knew what to do with somebody going to pray for them. But I prayed for them anyway, and I asked in the mighty name of Jesus, help them to sell more books this year than anybody else, and I pray that every door that they knock on, there's a Christian that answers that door, invites them in, gives them iced tea, lemonade, and feeds them. In the mighty name of Jesus, you boys go have a great summer. End of story, I thought. But I want you to know how powerful a copy of God's Word is. Fourteen years later, 14 years later, I'm at our local uh, 4-H uh, fair. And this young man stands up. He's the speaker for the Sunday service at the 4-H fair. And, he, and he's got a, an English accent, almost sounds Scottish. And he's proclaiming the gospel And he said, there's a Gideon man that gave me a Bible about 14 years ago, and I would love to meet that man. (laughs) He spotted me out in the audience, and he goes, I think that's you. And he walks to it. I go, I remember that 14 years ago. And he said, here's the rest of the story. He goes, everybody that opened the door that I knocked on was Christians. He said, this is the most unusual city I've ever been in in my life. So he came back for four years and sold Bibles until he was through with college. That year, he went to a church, and that church preached the gospel to him. And he said, it was like I was the only person in the room. And he said, I've been reading that little book. He said, I went forward, gave him my heart to Jesus Christ. He's now the pastor of that church in Kokomo, Indiana. And God said, you go back and give back to that community that helped you find Jesus. Don't give up. Don't back down. Don't run away. Take God's word with you everywhere you go. Thank you. And Nikki Farmer says thank you to all of you that give. Nikki has been winning people to Jesus Christ every day. He will not go to bed at night unless he's led at least one person to the Lord. He said, God sent me to the United States of America to pastor revival. And he said, when he sees the United States, one to the Lord, he's going back to Scotland. And he's going to go back there and do the same thing. Becky. 
received her New Testament when she was in fifth grade. She lives in a coal mining community in Virginia. This was a number of years ago. You may have heard this on the news or read it in the newspaper. The siren went off while she was at school. It was about 11 o'clock. And she couldn't understand why the siren would go off and it wasn't noon yet. But to back up a little bit, when she got her little Bible, she brought it home. And she wanted her daddy, coal miner daddy, to read that book. So she laid it on his favorite rocking chair And she hid around the corner when he came home from the coal mines, and he sits down in that rocking chair and reads his newspaper. So he knew he's going to read that. He lays it on the floor, picks up his newspaper, and reads it. That little girl runs to her bedroom, drops to her knees, and says, Jesus, how am I going to reach my daddy? That is the best story I've ever heard. My daddy needs to know about Jesus. And she says the Lord told her, put it in his coal miner pocket. And when he puts his jacket on, he'll take it with him. And so she did. She got up early in the morning, put it in his pocket. She washed around the corner. He put the jacket on, and the Bible went out the door with her daddy. Well, back to the siren going off, there was an explosion in the mine, and there were quite a few men trapped in the mine, and one of them was her dad. They dug and dug and dug, and you all know they did find the men. And one of the men, one of the rescue workers, found this little book in Becky's daddy's hand. And he felt like he needed to take it to Becky. Her dad didn't make it. And so there's a knock on the door. Becky comes to the door, and here's that rescue worker. He goes, Becky, I'm so sorry for your daddy's loss, your loss. But I have something for you because it has your name written in the back. And this, your daddy's finger was in this book clamped so hard on this little book we could barely get it out of his hand. And Becky took that little book and she looked in there and her daddy's name was on the back where he had signed and received Jesus as his Savior. (laughs) On the inside, beside that page, is a blank page. There were 15 men's names on that book. Wouldn't you like to be the one that gave a dollar and 30 cents so that Becky would receive that little Bible in fifth grade and take it home and give to her daddy? Yielded 15 men that are going to be in heaven today. And Becky's dad wrote her a little note, said, Becky, I'll never see you on this earth again, but I will see you again. Thank you for that little book. Oh, I have so many stories to tell you. I'm full and overflowing. Been in Venezuela for a week. Those people have absolutely nothing. They have no bread, no food. They, they don't have good water. They don't have coffee. They don't have uh, anything. They don't have pasta. They only have electricity three hours a day. But folks, they are hungry for God. And my interpreter goes, Senior Long, do you think this will have to happen in America? for God to get your attention in America? And I said, Diane, I hope not. Are we so bound by the stuff that we have that we forget that we have a need for the God that provides us with everything we need? And so Becky said, I will pray for you if you will pray for me. And I said, I will. I will pray. Pastor, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. And there's four things that I'd like to ask of this congregation. I was so happy to see that your name is House of Prayer. Because that's the number one thing on the list. We need prayer. I want to tell you one of the reasons we need prayer. As I was standing before teenagers, giving them all a brand new testament... This young man listened to me for an hour as I shared how to live the Christian life because another young Venezuelan girl goes, well, how do you live this thing called Christian? She had no idea. Well, being a youth pastor for 15 years, she floated my boat and I got right in gear. And for an hour, those children kept getting closer and closer and closer. I had them in the palm of my hand for an hour sharing with them how to live the victorious Christian life. When I was done... This young 14-year-old boy, folks, uh, I put it in here so I don't crush these. This is his lunch. This is his lunch. 
It is four cookies. That's all he'll have to eat for the entire day. I'm telling you, there's no food there. And he brings this up to me and he goes, Senior Long, I believe what you say. I want to live a victorious Christian life and I want you to have my cookies. Man, I'm breaking down. I asked my interpreter, should I take him? She goes, you have to take him. That is his step of faith that says, I believe. For a 14-year-old boy to give up his lunch, folks, that is a step of faith. And I took those cookies and I said, young man, I'm going to share these cookies with every congregation I talk to. And because of these cookies, there's going to be hundreds of dollars raised to buy more New Testaments just like yours. And we're going to send these Bibles around the world. And he goes, would you do that, please? And I said, I will. These cookies will pay for themselves over and over and over as God touches men, women, boys and girls' hearts to give so that the world would receive the Word of God. It's because of prayers like yours, those kind of stories can be told. Second, I will ask that you would give. Today you have an opportunity to give. You can give any time. But I'm asking this morning that if you would like to, you can give. And if you give, every penny of what you give goes to the work of the Gideons to spread the gospel by purchasing scriptures that go around the world in 200 countries and in 100 languages. And so however the pastor wants to accomplish that, I'll leave that up to you. But this morning, if you want to, if you want to write a check, just write it to the Gideons. If you want to give cash, that's great. If you want to give a penny, that's wonderful because a penny will buy one page in this New Testament. And all it takes is one little piece of paper in this book to win somebody to Jesus Christ. There was an angry man that took this Bible and tore it into shreds and threw the paper up in the air. And those papers started floating all over the place like thistle seed. And this man was sitting on the edge of the road ready to jump out in front of a Semite and kill himself. And this little piece of paper floated down and landed on his leg. And that little piece of paper was torn out of that New Testament. And it said, Jesus said. That so convicted that man because, see, this is alive. That he sought out a pastor in a local church, gave his heart to the Lord today. That man is a pastor. All because of two little words, less than a penny purchase that message so that that man would have a second chance. You believe in second chances? <laughs> That's what this is all about, men, women, boys, and girls in this place today. It's a book of hope. It's a book of second chances. Third, we have Gideon cards. Do you, I didn't see if you had a Gideon cards display or not, but those are free. You can use them. 365, thinking of you, in memory cards, special occasion cards. You just pull one out of your getting card display, give them away, send them off, mail them out. There's another envelope you can pull out of there and give a donation to purchase Bibles. Last, I'd like to invite you, if you're a Christian businessman, would like to join the Gideons, we need more help. There's only about 300,000 of us to help distribute Bibles around the world. We also have an opportunity to be friends of Gideon's. If you don't qualify as a Christian businessman, but you'd like to get Bibles, you can have them, buy them for $2 a piece. If you're a friend of the Gideon, I have an application for that as well. Last, I'd just like to say thank you for the honor and privilege of being here this morning. Thank you, Pastor. Pretty awesome, eh? Huh? Woo! God bless you, brother. Amen, amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I love hearing about people getting saved. I tell you what, he says in these, in these last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And if we would just put feet to that, if we would just, uh, you know, put the word in our heart, 
let it spill out across our lips. You know, it's not just going into the air, but God's Spirit is making sure that it finds its mark. Amen. Amen. To those that are ready to receive the gospel. And I know, you know, you may, uh, you might get discouraged in your witnessing and sharing with people. Well, you, you know, we got to be discerning because you got to know when to pick the fruit, right? So we're, 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 we're fruit inspectors. We're fruit pickers. Okay, so it don't take me but just a, a minute or so to, to, to understand if this person is ripe. You know, to hear the and ready to hear the gospel, amen. That may sound a little foreign to you, but that's that's my philosophy anyway. And so, don't what I'm wanting to say. Don't don't grow weary in well doing, because you will reap in due season if you faint not, amen. So he says, keep on keeping on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. We're going to hear from our news team this morning and we just ask you to come on up okay. Okay. Team, all right team, all right. Team, team. Come on, team. all right joel give us some announcements tell us what's going on all right there's their microphone there you go buddy all right good morning house of prayer how's everybody doing today wonderful wonderful all right we got a few announcements this morning uh We're going to start off here with the Hearts of Fire Choir and Soul Patrol will be singing at the Monroe County Fair this Friday, July 29th from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. So please come out and join us for that. Uh, The Women of Hope are holding a school supply drive from July 31st or through July 31st to help the Hope families. There's a box in the foyer marked school supplies. And as you're doing your own family shopping, please pick up one extra folder or a package of pencils, a notebook, at anything like that, and drop it off in the next two weeks. Every donation matters, and it doesn't matter the size, and it goes a long way to help the families here. And also, if you need help with school supplies, please fill out a school supply assistance application, and it's at the information station over there in the back. And uh, please turn in to Sister Jeanette by Sunday, July 31st. And uh, I got a question for you. Does your spaghetti taste funny? Uh huh. Yeah. I, I mean, I like spaghetti, and uh, and if you do too, come join us for a little taste of Italy, the soul clown or soul clown style, July thirty first, right after church. Five dollars for adults, two fifty for kids. And the Hell House Leaders Meeting is coming up Thursday, August fourth, at seven p.m. So uh, please start praying now and uh, about helping us out. Uh, the new twelve step class starts August fourteenth. At 2 p.m., sign-up sheet is posted. For information, please see Ron or Sandy Glasscock. And uh, we are planning a trip to Kentucky to see the Ark Encounter, a full-size replica of Noah's Ark, and the Creation Museum. We will leave at 6 a.m. on Saturday, August 26th, and return on August 27th. There are information sheets on the table, and please see Sister Jeanette for more information of that. Yes? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And the uh, Hope Prayer Line is looking for someone who would be interested in working with the team to contact people who request prayer and make sure their needs are met and that no one gets left behind. This would entail having access to both text and email on a constant basis and being able to contact quickly and forwarding information to the appropriate people here at the church. If interested, please see Ron Glasscock. And also, yes, oh, you just raised, okay, there he is. Raise it up one more time so they know. That's who you need to see. And uh, also, Unchained has uh, the bearded buckets in the back of the church back there. The pictures aren't on them yet, but what it is is we're raising money to help... uh, Help the kids of uh, people that are incarcerated and stuff get Christmas gifts and stuff like that. And uh, there's some names on the bucket. I'm one of them. Uh, Bobby is, Tom. There's, you know, Scooter. Scooter said he would shave his head. And what it is, whoever raises the most money by August 28th uh, has to either 
shave their beard, or if you're a scooter, shave your head. And uh, some of us here have, I mean, you know, I think, Bobby, how long have you had that? 30 years? He's not went, been without facial hair. So uh, that's a long time. Yeah, and uh, I look horrible, so don't put money in my bucket. Put it in scooters. <laughs> we would all like to see him bald. <laughs> and, uh, but they're back there in the back, so please uh, donate for that. And uh, I think that's it. All right. All right. You can put me down for shaving your head. No, I'll do that. Amen. How about nasal hair? Does that count? Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to add to, uh, you know, the um, trip, the road trip to Kentucky to see the uh, replica of Noah's Ark. I think that's going to be fascinating. Uh, there will be some of us that's just going to be making the trip, the one-day trip to the Ark, and then coming on back. And uh, so if you want to ride your bike down or, or do that, that's, uh, you know, don't want to spend the night. There are some of us that's going to do that, go see the Ark, and then we'll come on back. I think it's open from... From 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, leaving at 6 a.m. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, sounds like a lot of fun. Amen. I think the place is, I think it's full of live animals. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to ask our ushers to come this morning. And uh, our ushers were just passing out some envelopes. And so if you have, uh, uh, as part of your, uh, you want to give an offering to the Gideons this morning, put your offering in one of those envelopes and mark Gideons on it. Okay. Amen. And that would be great. Now, this isn't your tithe. Your tithe goes into your storehouse. This is an offering. All right. This is where you get the. This is where you get the full, the full blessing of the, of the thirty, some sixty, some hundredfold, is in a sacrifice and an offering. Okay, so this is how it works. They will be blessed. You will be blessed. Sure. All right, if you have your tithe, your offerings, and your hand, we lift them up to the Lord. We stand on the word of God. We know that his word will never return void. He'll always cause his word to prosper where he sends it. Malachi 3, 10, 11, and 12 says, I bring my tithe, bring my tithe into, the into the storehouse that there may be plenty. There may be plenty. And God says... He will open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing so big I won't be able to receive it all. And God says He will rebuke the devourer for my sake so that all nations here's where you smile will call me blessed. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Amen. We are strong in the Lord. Free, we 
not with flesh and blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is so good. Amen. 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 Brother Larry Clark, would you lift up your voice this morning, brother, and bless these tithing offerings? Yes, God. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Did you bring your Bibles this morning? <clears throat> All right. You brought your Bibles? Let's lift them up. And let's make this confession together. This is the Word of God. The incorruptible seed. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And praise God, I'll never be the same. Father, we give you glory this morning, Lord God. It is such a privilege, Lord, to know you, Lord God, to be called by you, Lord God, to be chosen by you, Father God. Lord, we give you praise this morning, Lord God, for, for your word, this word, a word that is as alive, Lord God, an overcoming word, a conquering word, Lord God. Lord, a, a word, Lord God, that uh, gives us the truth, Lord God, precepts, principles to live by, Lord God, that will give us life, Lord God. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your word, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to hear it. Anoint our ears to hear it. Anoint our hearts to receive it. Father, we give you praise in the wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus and all of God's people said. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Praise God. I believe we live in an exciting hour. I believe, uh, you know, 
I've, I've heard people say that, you know, I wished I lived back during Jesus' time. I wished I, you know, I could have walked with Jesus. And that, you know, and that was wonderful. But, you know, God had, he had, how many knows God doesn't make mistakes? He had the people that he needed for that hour. It's by no mistake that we were born for such a time as now. And I believe that, that, that we were all born, that we live in an exciting time. We live in the rapture generation. And I believe that, that we have been chosen. Praise God for this late hour to do the work of our Lord. Amen. And getting this gospel message out there. Amen. So, in the next few weeks, I'd like to begin a series to explore how the realm of darkness started. And we, and we want to discover what the term spiritual warfare means and, and how do we hope to win such a warfare. All right? So what happened? How did all this get started? Well... Let's start in the beginning. And that's the name of this first lesson, in the beginning. In the beginning, we know that according to bits and pieces of Scripture that a war broke out in heaven. When an angel, an archangel in fact, an anointed cherub by the name of Lucifer, he got all lifted up, he got all pushed out of shape with pride. How many knows that that's what pride does? All right? Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, verses 15 and 17, tells us that he, talking about Lucifer here, he was created perfect and he was blameless in all of his ways until, until iniquity or lawlessness was found in him. And this next, this next line here says, God was speaking to Lucifer, I believe. And he said, through your merchandising, you were filled with violence. Now, I, uh, that reminds me, reminded me of the mafia. Through your merchandising, you were filled with violence. And you sinned. I drove you out in disgrace from the mount of God. And I cast you out, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud. On account of your beauty and your and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. How many knows that pride just can't hardly endure that? <clears throat> to be called out. God said, I made a spectacle of you before kings. I want you to keep that in mind because we'll read a scripture here in a minute that, that said that Satan's mad, furious, in fact. And so it was, it was with all of his pride and his indignation that Lucifer <clears throat> was not content to be the beautiful, intelligent creature of God and of the highest order of angels that God had created him to be. But instead, Lucifer aspired to be in a position of equality with God. In short, Lucifer got the big head, all right, because of his beauty, because of his wisdom, and because of his position of authority. And so his pride deceived him in such a way that he actually thought that he could be God. Uh, a couple years ago, I saw a gal wearing a T-shirt and said, I believe in one God and no, you're not him. <laughs> Lucifer thought that he could actually rise up in one gigantic takeover and push God off of his throne. And so it was through this deception, a deception that comes through pride he thought he was so powerful, he thought that he could actually rise up and he could overthrow God. Now, isn't pride so deceptive, so seducing, 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, let him that thinks that he stands, take heed, beware, lest he fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride always goes before destruction and a haughty spirit, meaning a lofty spirit, a, a heady, high-minded spirit, always causes a fall. Proverbs 11 and 2, I like this, is when swelling, when swelling and pride come, then emptiness and shame will come also. So this whole warfare business, I believe, started when pride rose up in the heart of Lucifer. Isn't that how most warfare start? Through pride. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? Well, here's how it happened. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Isn't that the middle letter in pride? I, I. And then in the book of Revelations 12, 7 through 9, it tells us, and there was a war. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not. And neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now, can we just kind of get a picture of this? I mean, the Bible says that the angels whom God created that are without number. I find that intriguing because he says the very hairs of our head are numbered. But the, but the angels are innumerable. Are without number. Hebrews 12.22 says to an innumerable company of angels. Well, here's a war that broke out in heaven between Lucifer and one third of all the angels that he was in charge of. And here's Michael, another archangel. He was in charge of another one third of all the warring angels. I don't know where Gabriel was at during all of this with his one third of all the angels in the midst of all this. But all these angels who were without number battling going at it in the battle of all battles. What happened in this attempted takeover? Of course, what do we think happened? Revelations 12 and 9 tells us, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This means he lost. He lost the battle. Well, duh. Isaiah continues to write in Isaiah 14, 15, and 16. He says, yet you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And those that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you and shall say, is this the one who made the nations tremble and the one who did shake kingdoms? Is this the guy? It says here that those who are looking on are saying, you've got to be kidding me. You see, people are going to be amazed at the simple fact that Lucifer, Satan, is not nowhere near, not even close, to being the powerful personification of evil that everyone imagined him to be. That's how good of a liar he is. He's a good devil, isn't he? That don't sound right, does it? Sounds like an, sounds like an oxymoron. He's good at what he does. Luke 10 and 8, it says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I'm laying some groundwork with all of this for the, for the series that's following. Even those angels who were under Lucifer's authority, who rebelled with Lucifer, the Bible says in Jude, verse 6, that God has put them in chains of darkness in a place called Tartarus, a place of punishment, 
awaiting the final judgment. Jude says, and the angels which kept not their first estate, talking about their original position in heaven, but left their own habitation, talking about their place in the heavenlies. It says here, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, John continues to write here in Revelations 12 and 12. He says, therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. And there was a reason to rejoice, because Michael and the angels of God won the war. All right? But hold on. Here's the sad part. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Where do we live? I thought so. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. So this war, this spiritual warfare, was brought to earth. Now, Satan knows that he has but a short time. A short time to do what? Well, Jesus tells us in John 10 and 10, the thief comes only to do, to do whatever it takes, to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to take from your life. You see, what's happened, I believe, is that since Lucifer's plan to overthrow God not only failed miserably, not only blew back in his face, but his plan also got him kicked out of heaven. In fact, his place and his face was no longer even found in heaven anymore. Not even a fingerprint. Remember, Revelations 12, 7 and 9 tells us, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought his angels and prevailed not, and neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So after this great war in the heavenlies, and after God had bounced Lucifer out of his place, amen, How many knows that nothing sneaks up on God? God had this plan. He had this plan. He says, now that I have a vacancy here in heaven, and I have a vacancy in the earth that I have created, I need to put someone in charge of it. So God says, I'll make someone just like me. Right? Right? Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over everything in the earth. Now, even though God is one Lord, one God, according to Deuteronomy 6 and 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, this word one here is not is not like the number one, the numeral one, but I believe that that this word one, that God is so one with himself, that God is so complete in himself, and that's what the word one here means in the Hebrew, even though God is so one in himself, you can't add any more to God to make him any more complete than he already is. How many believes that? He is one Lord, so complete. Well, he speaks of himself here in Genesis 126. And I want to bring something out. You may not believe this, and this is okay, but study it out. Look at the scripture. You know, I mean, how many knows we can, we can add to the scripture and we can take away, but let's just take what the word says without conjecture and all of that, Okay. Well, he says here, let us make man. Now, he speaks of himself here in Genesis 1, in the plural sense. In the plural sense, let us make man after our likeness. And then the word that's used for God here in the Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim, which is a plural word, masculine dominant. How many knows that God is our heavenly father and not our heavenly mother? but he's referred to as our Heavenly Father, okay? Now, um, and what I want to say here, I know that this, this is a favorite scripture that people use to uh, say that it's referring to the Trinity, 
of the Godhead, but it, no, it doesn't say that anywhere. That's all an opinion. That's all conjecture. You'll not find that. But I believe the Scripture is talking about gender. Gender. In the gender sense. Well, how do we know that? Well, there's proof in this, in this chapter. Let's read the very next verse. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in whose image? His own image. In the image of God created He. Talking about Adam. He created He, Him, Adam. Male and female created He. Talking about Adam, them. Male and female created He, them. He created Adam, male and female. Whose image did He create Adam, Adam in? His own image, right? All right. And, and I'm nowhere near suggesting that for a moment that the Bible is suggesting that God created Adam with male and female body parts. I'm not saying that. But we do know that Eve, we're talking about the female part of God, was created internally inside of Adam just like God. Because God was so one with himself. Genesis 1.27, male and female created he them. All right? He created Adam, male and female. How many of you ladies know that you're created just as much in the image of God as the men are? Yeah. Well, some of you know that. Are we, are we starting to get on the same page yet? How do we know that God created Adam, male and female? Because right here in Genesis 2.18, it says God concluded that it wasn't good for man to be, the King James says, alone. But actually, what that word alone means, it wasn't good for man to be all one, like God was all one. So in Genesis 2.21-22, God caused a deep sleep. You see, he had to... He had to put man to sleep just so he'd stay out of the way because God was trying to... God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he took a rib from Adam's side and he made woman. And in verse 23, Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Well, I said all of that to say this. We just took the long way around the barn. For what I want us to see is that even though Lucifer and Michael... And all the angels are all created beings created by God. We were created in the image of God. In the image of God. And we need to be reminded of just how special we are to Him. And why God gave Adam and Eve, why He gave to all of mankind this place, this special place of authority and position. Because Lucifer blew it. So God created Adam and Eve to take his place. To have that special place of authority and dominion. God told Adam and Eve in the beginning here in Genesis 1.28. It says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. And I want you to multiply. And I want you to replenish the earth. The King James says. Well, another rabbit trail here. Webster's Dictionary says that the word replenish means, number one, to fill again as something that has been completely or partially emptied. Or number two, to bring back to fullness or completeness. And number three, it says to repeople. So this is kind of alluding to the fact that there was something here beforehand. I don't know, but he, they use the word replenish. All right? Then he goes on to say, after you've replenished it, I want you, and we'll blow your minds here again, because I know people have a real bad habit of blaming God for everything. When something bad goes wrong, it's all God's fault. Well, he says, oh, see now, we say it's the devil's, but it's that place of position and authority was taken away from him and given to who? Oh, this is where the plot thickens. He said, I want you, 
to subdue it. What does subdue mean? Well, he continues to tell us, and have dominion over it. Subdue it and have dominion over it. What does this word dominion mean? This is Webster's dominion means to have sovereign authority. (laughs) We just don't want the responsibility of the bad choices that we've made. So it must be God's fault. He has. He's he's a sovereign God, so it's all his fault. He could correct this. But God says, I put wait a minute. He said, I'll put you in charge. I'll put you in charge. You're the one making the choices. Number two, it means to have absolute right of ownership and control of property, especially land. This is what Webster says. So once again, the question is, according to this scripture, after God had made man, Adam and Eve, who did he place in charge over everything that he had created here on planet Earth? Who did he give sovereign control to? So now we can see why the devil is so upset and is after us. He wants his place back. He wants that sovereign control. God knew that there was a devil on the loose. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He knew that, and he warned Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Paul says in Ephesians 4.27, don't give place to the devil. Don't give your place to the devil. How many knows you give the devil an inch? He'll take a mile. Don't give place to the devil. Jesus said in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast. As if somebody's trying to take it away from you. Hold fast to what you have so that no man can take your crown. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul says, We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. We're not because this word exposes him. But if you don't read it, you're ignorant of the devil's devices. But we are not when we read the word of God. He gives us everything that we need to know. It equips us for this spiritual warfare that's going on, going on around us. And no, the ostrich approach will not work. You cannot stick your head in the sand and just believe that everything's just going to go on as it was. And, well, if, maybe if I don't bother the devil, he won't bother me. <laughs> well, you're already bothered in that. All right? But we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. We know what he wants. He wants his place of authority and position back. But God gave it to us. Well, the word or character title of devil means slanderer or to harass excessively or a personality who has gone bad, an antagonist who is very disliked. Some other descriptions of the devil include El Diablo, Old Scratch, Mephistopheles, the dragon, the old serpent, the accuser. Jesus says in John eight forty four that he was a murderer from the beginning and he abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him when he speaks a lie. He speaks of his own character for he is a liar and he's the father of all liars. Well, here's the deal right here. Satan is not only a liar, but he invented lying. He's the father of all lies and liars. In fact, all through the Gospels, Jesus warns us over and over and over again about false Christs, false prophets coming in his name. Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and it's no wonder because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He pretends to be something that he's not. He masquerades so that he'll not be detected. Paul continues in verse 15, Therefore, it's no great problem to figure out that his ministers masquerade as ministers of righteousness. And people all over the world, they're falling for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Eve fell for it as Lucifer came slinking into the garden, masquerading as a serpent. The serpent says to Eve here in Genesis 3 and 1, Yay! Did God really say that? 
You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And then he says in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, you shall not surely die. That's not what God meant. I'm just paraphrasing here. For God knows that in the day that you eat of the tree, that your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. Pants on fire. So what's, what's all this masquerading about? Well, Lucifer wants his place back. And he's willing to do anything to get it. We're talking about spiritual warfare this morning. Well, His, his plan worked. Genesis 3 and 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took from the tree and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, standing right there watching her. Brother Don, do you think that, they're, that God's going to have Adam and Eve in protective custody when we get there to heaven? I think about stuff like that. He was standing right there, and then he ate it. So right here in this verse, I believe we have three aspects of temptation that Satan uses to get what he wants. And his primary goal is to, to make us fall. He wants us to fall into disobedience and forfeit our God-given place of authority and dominion. 1 John 2.16 tells us, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life, they're not of the Father, but of the world. And we know who the prince of the power of darkness is. Verse 7, Genesis 3 tells us that all of a sudden, their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. They were no longer innocent like children. They had a new awareness of themselves and, and of each other in their nakedness and their shame. The bottom line here is, is that this was a huge loss for all of mankind. Huge loss. Adam forfeited back to Lucifer all property rights, dominion, and authority here on planet Earth. And that's where the devil comes in. He's in on this. Not to mention, not to mention here, ushering in sickness and disease and death. Smile, I got some good news. The war's not over by any means. In fact, it was just starting to warm up. Once again, how many knows nothing sneaks up on God? He already had a plan. God told the serpent here in Genesis 3.14, He said, because you've done this, you are cursed. You're cursed above all cattle. You're cursed above every beast of the field. And upon your belly, you will go. Must have had legs. Don't have legs anymore. He's got to eat dirt. Upon your belly, you will go and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Well, God wasn't done yet. Genesis 3.15, God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity, I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall crush your head and you shall strike his heel. Now this is quite a statement here. This is quite, or you might say quite a prophecy. And I'll close with this thought this morning that will lead us into next week's lesson. God said to the serpent, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Well, the antagonism between people and snakes, this, this mutual hostility and opposition, which is still very much a game setter in today's world. How many here doesn't like snakes? See, there it is. This is proof what God said. This prophetic word here given by God, I believe, symbolizes the outcome of this titanic struggle between God and the evil one. A struggle, a war that is played out in the hearts and the history of all mankind. And we know that the offspring of woman would eventually crush the serpent's head at the cross of Calvary. 
Praise God. Amen. Amen. Jesus got us back onto the, the playing ground. Amen. We're back in play again. And we know that the offspring, amen, got his head crushed at Calvary where Jesus won a decisive victory to put mankind back onto the battlefield. So we'll learn more about this spiritual warfare next week to see who the seed of the serpent is and who the seed of the woman is and how we can fight against an opponent that we cannot see. All right? All right. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, Lord, that we have the victory this morning. Praise God. We thank you, Lord God. Lord, for those, all of those who have enlisted in the fight. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for victory this morning over sickness and disease. And yes, over, over death, hell, and the grave itself. Lord, because you gained victory over death, hell, and the grave. We thank you, Father God, Lord God, for personally choosing us, picking us, Lord God. Lord, being born for such a time as now, Lord God. Help us, Father God, to put on the whole armor of God and stand, stand in that evil day, this evil day. Father God, we thank you for victory this morning. We ask everybody to stand this morning. And we want to give you an opportunity. If you're here this morning and you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your life to make him Lord of your life. If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. We want to give you an opportunity to be on the winning team. We want you to, God wants you to have hope this morning. He wants you to put your faith in Him. John 16, 33. He forewarned His disciples just as He has forewarned us. There's going to be tribulation. In this world, you shall have tribulation. There's going to be problems. There's a devil on the loose. But He said, be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. He said, put your peace. Find your peace in me. If you're trying to find peace in this world, you're not going to find it. It's not here. But find it in Jesus Christ. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you that God has dealt with your heart. You, you surrendered. And speaking personally, from that moment, from that moment, 2.30 in the morning, when I said yes to God you talk about a peaceful easy feeling he gave me a peace then that I still have in my heart today and yes I have I have ran head on headlong into the into problem and tribulations of this world but you know what I always find my peace in God and that's and that's where that's why we can be strong and steady in the faith and, and to fight this fight of faith and to be overcomers in this life. When you, when you sign up to be on Jesus' team, when you pick Him as your partner, you've just, you've just picked the best tag team partner on the block. I believe it breaks the heart of God when he sees us out in the ring trying to fight the devil all alone, getting the snot stomped out of us. And he's hanging over the ropes. He's hanging over the ropes this morning. You've watched tag team wrestling. And he's saying, tag me. Let me in the ring. Let me in your life. Take a break. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask, would you come this morning? Would you come and invite Jesus in your heart, in your life? He walked up that, that Via Della Rosa, that road that led to Golgotha's Hill, Mount Calvary. He endured those spikes that were driven in his hands and feet. He endured the beating. He endured the spear that pierced his side. 
He did all of that for us, for you, for me. And He says, come. He says, come this morning. All of you that are weary, weak, and heavy laden, come unto me. Come to me. Would you come to Jesus this morning? Would you come to Jesus? Would you come? Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice.
God, we thank you, Lord God, Lord, for this wonderful thing, this wonderful salvation, Father God, that you give us new life, Lord God, you give us abundant life, you give us eternal life, Lord God, Lord, we thank you this morning, Lord God, that you, you call us one of your own, that we're your people, Father God, you're our God, Lord God, hallelujah, we are so blessed this morning, Lord God, Lord, Lord, that you, 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 you saved us, and Lord God, you, you filled us with your power, Lord God. You didn't forsake us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God. Lord, that you've placed a sword in our hand, Lord God. You've given us the shield of faith, Lord God. Lord God, you have dressed us in the whole armor of God, Father God, that, that we can go forth, Lord God, and we can be victorious in battle, Lord God. We could be victorious over all the enemy's uh, wiles and schemes, Lord, his tactics, Lord God. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God. Lord, for a time of celebration here this morning, Lord God. We thank you, Father God. Lord, we just thank you, Lord God, as we lift you up, Lord God. Lord God, we pray that many, many will come to you, Lord God, as we go forth, as we leave this place, Lord God. Lord God, with a testimony, Lord, in our hearts, Lord God, your, your word, Lord God, in our hearts, Father God. Lord, as we share what you've done in our lives, Lord God, as we're living sacrifices, living testimonies to your kindness, Father. Lord, we give you a praise today, Lord God. We give you a praise in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen, 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 amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 